is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is the Alienware 15 R3. Again, we reviewed the Alienware 15 R3 in November of 2016, so not that long ago, but since then, Dell, who owns Alienware, has refreshed it with Intel Kaby Lake 7th generation CPUs, one we looked at had 6th generation Sky Lake. So the overall design, the features, they're all the same, but they've changed a few things, like the display options that are available, and obviously that CPU generation change and the updated heatsink design. So particularly I was interested in seeing this to see if it ran noticeably cooler and quieter. Hint. Things are looking good, and this is definitely the most improved player for 2017 so far. We're going to look at it now. So the Alienware 15 R3, again, it's still the R3, same exact casing as the last one we designed. So this was going to be a quick, we're going to go over things fast, cover it, and then we'll get to what's different here in terms of mostly thermals and performance. You have the nice soft touch finish here, picks up fingerprints some. You have a backlit trackpad, programmable zone backlighting here is so any color scheme you want. You've got it. You've got your macro keys right over here. Soft touch buttons here, which means it doesn't take much to press them down. I like that. I leave it up to you as to whether you do, but it's a very good, very accurate, very pleasant trackpad. Likewise, the keyboard. I still like it. I know some of you don't like anything that doesn't look like a chiclet or island style keyboard with space between the keys, but this is a dream to type on. It's still very heavy thanks to the inner metal roll cage and the beautiful internal design. When you see it, it's the most organized thing and it has sort of a subframe which gets in the way of upgrades we'll talk about that but uh, it's very heavy as a result so it's 7.7 .7 pounds or three and a half kilograms this is one of the heaviest 15 inch gaming laptops on the planet but it is sturdy and there's a very limited lid flex here they've changed the display panel offerings up a little bit this time around this you can still get the base 1080p IPS display, that's 300 nits. Uh, the last generation we reviewed it, I liked that panel just fine. It was competitive with other gaming laptops in this price range with an IPS panel. Good colors, matte, and all of these are, you know, matte and untouched displays. And I hear that it's not as great looking this time around. I haven't seen one that doesn't look great to me, though, so far. Next up in price is this one here, the TN panel. It's a fast refresh, 120 hertz refresh panel. That's all the rage right now, these fast refresh TN panels. Otherwise, you don't see TN anymore. Everything is IPS or IGZO these days. I personally wouldn't pick this one because the contrast is so weak on this. The contrast is, well, the black level is 0 0.92. It's usually you see 0.4. That means it's not getting very black. The blacks are really gray. So the contrast ratio is 420 to 1. It's not great. When you're crawling dungeons in a game, ugh. You know, I'll, I'll take a little bit of ghosting with an IPS display any time over it. But still, it's available. It, it, is, it is the upsell here. And there's 400 nits of brightness. And lastly, there's a 4K sharp IGZO option, which is lovely looking. And it's very nice if you're going, you're going to be using this for pro apps too, for graphics work, that sort of thing. In terms of design, well, we still have the fan hanging over the back side kind of design here. And all the ports are on the back except for the USB ports, which I find convenient because they don't get in my way. Some people like it, some people don't. We still have the Alienware graphics amplifier port and we have Thunderbolt 3. Now, I like the graphics amplifier port mostly because it's a lot cheaper than the Razer Core. Yeah, the Razer Core is 500 bucks, and then you have to buy a graphics card. The, the Alienware amplifier is typically around $250. You might even find it for less in some stores having a sale. So it's a cheaper way to get into an external graphics card when you feel the need to update this a couple of years from now. It comes with Pascal 10 series graphics cards. You got the GTX 10 50 Ti, the 1060, the 1070, no 1080 in the 15 inch, too much heat, just no way that they could do that. We have the 1070 model in this. So powerful, yes, you, you'll see me playing Mass Effect Andromeda on ultra settings and it manages to keep it up at 120 frames per second, which is impressive. Of course, we've got killer Ethernet here. It's E2500. You have killer Wi-Fi 1435 AC. Upgradable internals, as always. Bottom panel here, you just remove the Phillips head screws, and you have access to the core internals, which is the SSD and the memory. If you want to get to everything else, oh, and the hard drive, too. If you want to get to everything else, you have to take off the inner subframe, say if you wanted to repaste your CPU and GPU. But happily with this refresh, now, for those who've been following Alienware, you know that there was a little brouhaha with the the late 2016 edition having heat sinks that sometimes weren't completely flat, which means they didn't rest right against the CPU and they didn't do a very good job of dissipating heat. 
and they used some thermal pads that weren't exactly the right thickness. They redesigned all that for the Skylake edition, and they fixed the ones that were out there. People had problems, but from the get-go, the KB Lake has all those fixes, and boy, does it make a difference. I'm telling you, where the last generation was a little too noisy for me, and, and I actually considered buying one for myself, and so I'm pretty enthusiastic gamer. Uh, but it was just a bit too noisy. Now, my core temperatures weren't that high. The GPU temperatures are never a problem on these, but it was it was kind of loud. So now they've fixed it, and it's just got your normal, average, decent-sized chassis laptop whoosh of air. I mean, you'll hear it when you're gaming, no kidding, but it's not going to be loud or grating or, oh my god, it was like a vacuum cleaner before. And the core temperatures, they stay very stable, and I hadn't seen it really go much above 81 degrees centigrade when gaming. And you can see, we got a Screen capture of some core temperatures when running Unigine benchmark, and it, it's all good, folks. So that's the news. Definitely a lot safer to buy it. So the Alienware 15 starts at 1200 bucks. That's a core i5 with 8 gigs of RAM and a GTX 1050 Ti, and not too exciting. And a 1 terabyte 7200 RPM hard drive. All these configurations have a 7200 RPM hard drive, which is a good thing with a SATA 3 interface. More people would probably be interested in the 1060 model. That's where it really starts to get good, and you can play pretty much all games on high settings at least. And that gets you a Core i7-7700 HQ, which is what we have in ours. 16 gigs of DDR4 RAM. By the way, they use 2400 megahertz RAM in these. That's about 1650. Of course, you can go look for sales, and Dell always has good sales, and try to get it for less money, too, but that, that's the list price as of today on their website. The GTX 1070 configuration starts just under $2,000, and again, we have the 1070. The SSDs, just what, like with the last iteration, everything except for the 128-gig SSD is PCIe NVMe. The, the 128 gig model is just SATA 3. So we have a Samsung PM961 in ours. It's a 512 gig. So that's the fastest SSD you can get right now. That's pretty good stuff inside. And you'd expect Alienware is a big name company that they, and these things are not cheap. You should be getting good internals here. Thunderbolt 3, again, is standard. No SD card slot. Alas, kind of hard to imagine with a big chassis like this. Granted, it's not that thick. It's one inch thick, which is 25.4 millimeters. But still, yeah. And you still have your choice between the 68 watt hour and 99 watt hour battery options. Now, that's where battery life, it really depends on what configuration you get. Obviously, it depends on the battery size that you pick. I think, given it's already pretty heavy, you might as well go for the 99 watt hour battery. The price differential really isn't much there. But then it depends on which display you get. If you get the, the IPS 1080p base model, that has Optimus, NVIDIA Optimus switchable graphics, so no G-Sync there. So that has the best potential battery life when unplugged. If you're not doing something terribly graphically demanding, that, that's the one that really can be very impressive in terms of battery life. I'm talking like easily six to eight hours for light work. But the other options that don't have Optimus, you're not going to get quite that kind of battery life, especially with the 4K display that consumes the most power. So again, it's going to be mix and match battery capacity versus, yeah. Just like the last generation, you get a Windows Hello camera that works just fine for login and Toby eye tracking, which I still find to be, well, pretty useless. There's really not much in the way of any games that make good use of that feature. You got the Alienware Tactx keyboard with the multi-zone backlighting and the, obviously, the backlight trackpad there. HDMI 2.0, which is nice to have, and DisplayPoint 1.2 also. So. Performance on this, I mean, the, the, the improved thermals really do help. The performance on this was very strong. We saw better be benchmarks than we saw with the Skylake model just from several months ago. And it's not because KB Lake is much faster than Skylake. At best, it's somewhere between 5 and 10% faster for CPU functions. And we've got the same GPU in it that we had the last time. It's just able to run full bore better. And you can see the benchmarks on screen here. I mean, very, very good numbers for a machine with the i7-7700 HQ and the 1070 on board. Really impressed. So if you're looking for something that can run any pro app well, one of the most powerful laptops available, well, this would certainly be it. If you're going to be using it for Photoshop, for 3D modeling, that sort of thing, yes, it's great. And obviously for gaming, it, it's fantastic. I, there, there isn't a game out there that you can't play at least on high settings, and many of them you can play on ultra. So Sweet. And it should stay that way for the next year or two before games find some new way to be even more piggish. But given the improvements with things like DirectX 12 performance, I expect that it's going to hold up nicely. Obviously, it does VR too. 
and taking a look, look at the internals they're just the same as the R3 that we reviewed in November. They're not going to change the architecture or it would be called the, well, R4. It's also very similar to the Alienware 17 in terms of the layout. So you've got your two fans here, CPU and GPU. We have two RAM slots, so maximum will be 32 gigs. We got two 16 gig modules. This is our 7200 RPM, one terabyte hard drive. And here is our SSD again, Samsung SSD, PCIe, NVMe. Here's another M two slot right here and a third half height one so pretty expandable as things go oh and under this little right here and piece of mylar is the wi-fi card so easily accessible for all the stuff that you generally want to do with it now like like i said if you want to go ahead and repaste your cpu and gpu then you have to take off the subframes you have to take off all the screws that retain this piece right here so you can actually get to the rest of the internals but Given the fact that they have fixed the cooling issues, it's unlikely that you're going to be wanting to do that anytime in the near future, but you can do it whenever you do wish to do it. So that's the Alienware 15 R3, the early 2017 edition. Still heavy enough that you can actually develop your biceps doing this. It, again, it's 7.7 .7 pounds and, or 3.5 kilograms. It is one of the heaviest 15-inch gaming laptops on the market. That said, it's also built like a tank. It's very durable. This is something I would not worry about in my backpack. It might destroy anything else in the backpack. Definitely much improved in terms of thermals. It's a lot quieter. It runs a lot cooler. The CPU core temperatures are very good on this. The GPU is never much of a problem. And it's nice with the Alienware because there are a variety of different GPU configurations you can get to fit your budget. Of course, I'm not sure that the 1050 Ti is really going to sell much. If you're going and ready to spend on Alienware, then getting a GPU you could get in a $1,000 budget gaming laptop doesn't have its appeal. But starting with the 1060 on up, it's pretty exciting stuff. And it's well made. I particularly like still that, that graphics amplifier port, the Alienware graphics amplifier port, because their graphics amplifier is generally around 250 bucks. So it's not so much money as something like the, the Razer Core. So that gets you into future proofing if you want to run an external GPU. Those are some good things about it. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube videos for more cool tech videos and thumbs up if you like this.